this evening we have a double header from uh, Pastor Kim. And I'm going to ask him to do the first portion of his presentation. And then we will have a time of prayer. And then he's going to take us into the book of Revelation. But the first part, um, can you remember some of the places that Kim took us to? Can you remember... There we go. Somebody remembers going to Thyatira with him. Where else did we go? Okay. I can hear mumblings of all sorts of city names coming out. And uh, there we go. There we go. Laodicea, Philadelphia, Sardis. Everybody's running through the churches right now and saying, I know there were seven of them. I know he took us to at least seven. So this evening, he's not taking us to another church, because we've been through the seven churches, but rather he's taking us to a place that he mentioned before, the, along the Jordan River, the lowest spot of all, the Dead Sea. So, Kim, thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see you all. This was in 2008, my first close-up glimpse of the Dead Sea. You can see this is salt, eh? The white is salt. This is just from the bus's window. They're not great pictures, but just out of the bus, I was taking the pictures. And uh, this was interesting. Dear guest, if you wish to be served, please wear your Nirvana bracelet. Now, oh, that sounded very strange. And uh, very soon we actually got our bracelets. We all had to wear like this yellow thing around our arm to access the hotel and to get food, etc., etc. And it just reminded me of a presentation that Brian did. Remember the Mark of the Beast? You know, if you, you need something to be able to buy and sell. And, you know, it was amazing, you know, to study that prophecy. So th this was a little foretaste. If you don't uh, comply, you will not receive. It was a Sabbath afternoon. I went on a, a lovely walk along the, can you say beach? <laughs> it's solid salt. Salt, salt, salt. You can look at that. Um, sorry, this thing, where am I clicking this? It's off. That's salt. And that's our hotel in the background. Nothing grows there. Um, there's so much, it's like minerals and all sorts of stuff that there's no life in the Dead Sea. No microorganisms. Nothing. It's dead. It's the only dead place on earth. You know, you find life in deserts. You find life in the ice, but not here. There's zero life, nothing. That's the, the Jordan side. So I'm standing uh, on the, the Israel side and looking across, and there you can see the hills in Jordan. Remember we were on that side when we looked across to Jericho where Moses was standing? Moses was on that side looking this way. And look at the salt. Has this thing got a little light? All right. Sorry, I thought it might have a little light that I could use. Okay, if you look here, this is solid salt going in. So it goes under the water. The salt just continues. There you can see the salt again. It's actually beautiful, the shapes that um, have formed. And there you can see my foot. Can you see those shapes in the salt? They're just incredible. There's no sand there. Just salt. And there's a bus. Um, that I saw parked there, Dead Sea Tours. 
And that's actually the shape of the Dead Sea. Now the sad thing is that the Dead Sea is drying up. Um, it, it only has an inlet. It doesn't have an outlet. So you would think it, it, you know, it has to stay full. But what's happened is they're pumping a lot of water out of the Jordan. So there's not much water reaching the Dead Sea. And there's a lot of evaporation happening. And they even um, trying to dry up. There's a big fight going on. In 2008, um, our guy told us that it's like individuals. I don't know if they're brothers or a family that actually own the Dead Sea. And there's this lawsuit going on because these guys want the water away so that they can get the minerals. And you know they make all that stuff that you rub on your body and the whole story. So they're making tons of money exporting the products of the Dead Sea. And, um, but the country is considering pumping water from the Mediterranean into the Dead Sea to save the Dead Sea. But I don't know what happened now further. You can just see some pictures here. This is now the next morning. I went down. I wanted to have a, you can't say a swim. It's a float. You know, you can't, you can't swim there. You don't want to get your eyes in there. It's like battery acid. And uh, you can see the sun coming up. The people are out there very early. I mean, tha that's now a meter or two under that man. You see the man over there? And he's sitting like this. You know, there's, it's incredible. You don't have to kick. You don't have to do anything. You just float. This is taken from the hotel window. This is one of my friends that was on the trip. He was looking from the top, looking down. Now, what's amazing is that I tried. You know, when you stand in the water about, like, let's say there's a meter underneath me. I can only go this deep up to my armpits. I can't go any deeper. You can try. You can go like this, you know. But you can't. It's like it just holds you. It's amazing. It's like incredible. I can't explain it. It's like, and then it wants to lift you the whole time. Your legs are <laughs> coming up the whole time. You just got to <laughs> try and, like, keep your head and your face out the water. Oh, I don't know what happened now. Sorry, guys. This clicker, it's, it's um, giving me challenges. Okay. Let me do something. Sorry, friends. We hope we can sort that. And uh, you can see. You know, I just need a newspaper now, you know. <laughs> Relaxing. And this was now recently this year. This is taken from Masada. Mount Masada, you're looking over the, d the Dead Sea. Um, it's about 400 meters below sea level. It's the lowest place on earth, and um, it's the deadest place on earth. Absolutely no light, I mean no life. Uh, this was from the bus. You can see it's not very wide. It's actually a lake. It's a saltwater lake. And uh, I've had to take this picture, the lowest bar in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and um, sadly, when people drink, you know, they often start acting like animals, don't they? They go below what God created us to be. So it does take you down. This bar has got a double, you know, lowness about it. <laughs> and um, this is the place where we went to swim. It's an amazing experience, and um, I have some something special here. I have a piece of salt that I actually uh, picked up at the Dead Sea that you can have a look at just now. It's like a little twig, and the salt crystals have formed around it. And um, <coughs> I've got another surprise that I will um, share with you just now. Friends, I think I'm just going to go over Daryl. Is that all right? Okay, we're going to try this clicker. Tonight's topic is Revelation's Lake of Fire. So I want to invite you to bow your heads as we pray. 
Lord, we want to thank you for your great love. Thank you for the privilege of studying your word this evening. We pray that your spirit will lead us and help us to get to know you as our loving Father, as our God. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sorry, friends, this thing's not working. So I have to make another plan. All right, we're going to try from here. Is that okay? So on the morning of the 23rd of February 1991, the Kuwaiti citizens woke up to a huge inferno. Remember the war desert storm when um, the Iraqi forces led by Saddam Hussein went in and they were causing havoc and then the coalition forces were driving them back. And as a goodbye present, Saddam Hussein um, blew up 90% of the Kuwaiti oil wells. And this is what was left. It was just a huge, huge fire. The, the world was, was crying out. They said, we must stop this disaster. This must end. They had to get in a special team. A weeks became months. And eventually, this specialized team was able to put out the fire. And during this time, people were remembering images from the book of Revelation. Thinking of Revelation 14.10, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. And they said, this that happened in Kuwait is like a foretaste of what is happening in the book of Revelation. Verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. So people saw in that fire like a type of the fire spoken about in the book of Revelation. Now a question that we want to answer tonight. Does God want some disaster called hell to burn forever and ever? The Kuwaiti citizens, this, the, the, the population of planet earth, were not happy with that fire burning. They said, put it out. The fire must be put out. You must understand the, that fire and the oil uh, it, it went into the Kuwaiti Gulf and all the marine life that was affected and killed and destroyed because of that massive disaster. Uh, the world was saying, put out the fire. So the question is, does God want some disaster called hell to burn forever and ever? The pictures of heaven are beautiful in the Bible, aren't they? Beautiful pictures. On Sabbath morning, Brian took us, you know, um, through some of those passages of Scripture. But for many Christians, there's a dichotomy, there's a problem. It's like, I want to go to this beautiful place, but when you go to this place, you are going to be hijacked. You are going to be robbed. You will possibly be killed. You know, like, there's some beautiful places on the planet that we can visit on a holiday. We can go there on holiday. But when you go there, what's going to happen? They're going to hijack you. So are you going to feel happy going there? You're not going to feel happy. You're going to say, no. And, and now with heaven, there's a problem because there's hell. You see, there's like this eternal bliss, but there's eternal fire. And that becomes a very big challenge. In fact, friends, I'm standing before you as someone who wants to rectify a very big error. Because many Christians, especially dear Catholic people, have turned their backs on God because of this doc doctrine of eternal hell. They become unbelievers in God because of that. Revelation 21 verse 2 says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. But then there's these images of fire. And, and how do we reconcile the two? How, how do we understand God's character? I don't know if any of you have ever watched that um, children's, um, I don't know, like a little film called Babe. About the little pig. And remember um, when this little pig started understanding that humans eat animals. Remember? And then he thought, oh, you know, like, the duck is going to be killed for Christmas and this and that. And then he asked um, even the boss. You know, him and, him and the boss were good friends. And he said, even the boss, does he also eat animals? So for a Christian to think that God is love, Jesus died on the cross for me, he gave his all for me, but he's going to punish people, not just for one day, or one week, or one month, or one year, or one decade, or one century, or one millennium, but for eternity. Then you start saying, is this a God of love? Revelation 20 verse 9. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Now, Brian has gone through these verses with us. Tonight we're recapping a bit and just putting the lake of fire in context. So, at the end of the thousand years, the holy city descends, wicked dead are resurrected, Satan and his followers attack the city, the wicked are devoured by the flames. Revelation 20 verse 9, and fire came... So, it's going to be something like that. <laughs> and fire came... <laughs> okay. And fire came down from where? from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now, this is very important for us to see where does the, fi the fire come from. All right? The fire comes from heaven. Okay. So many people believe that hell is like a hot spot in the earth. You've heard those stories? You know, it's like there's some, like a torture chamber. But if you look at the Bible, and the Bible only, the fire comes down, from heaven. Very important. Revelation 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So now we need to look at the second death. You've heard the saying, a cat's got nine lives. But we're looking tonight at the second death. Now, I'll, I want to tell you a quick story. It was in 1993. There was a, a person who was close to me. We were at school together. And I had the privilege of actually doing a Bible study with this person. And it was the first time in this person's life that they had read about the second death. The first time. They'd never known about it. But you've seen it in the Bible, it's there. So what is the second death? The first death is the death that we all die as the natural result of living in a sinful world. Now, do you know anybody that's 150 years old? No one? I mean, I think we'll agree, by God's grace, 75 is, is a, a wonderful age, isn't it? You know, 75, praise the Lord. Uh, 85, 95, 100. Wow, like, you know, 100. Anybody? 105, 110, 120. You know, you don't hear of people like that. Why? Because the aging process sets in and people die. That's part of life, sadly. This is the first death. So, saints and sinners, 
righteous and unrighteous, godly and ungodly, all die the first death. Do we agree? We all agree. So, here's a young man sitting next to his father who is at his last. And friends, I want to tell you something. If Jesus doesn't come soon, it will be my name on the bulletin at the funeral. It will be my favorite hymns that will be sung. It will be my family that's crying. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? To think that if Jesus doesn't come soon, then I'll be next. Each one of us, our funerals will come. Just sit a matter, this one, we don't know who's next, but one of us will be next. The second death is an eternal death as a result of personal rebellion against God. Now, this is very important. The first death is a result of living on a sinful planet. But the second death is because of a choice that has been made. So, in Revelation chapter 20, we read that Satan and the host of the wicked want to attack the city. And then, there's a verse that says, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow that God is just, isn't it? We, we, they acknowledge that Christ is Lord. Now, this is the place where everybody who has ever lived will be alive. Think about it. The righteous are where? Inside the city. The wicked are where? Outside the city. And there's an acknowledgement. And only after that acknowledgement, that's when God will destroy. And Satan and Sinners and sin are destroyed forever. Revelation 21 verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now, if it's a new heaven and a new earth, I want to ask your opinion. I'm not going to now send the mic around, but would you like to have hell part of a new heaven and a new earth? How would you feel? Would you like to have that? You don't want that. Who would like a cemetery in heaven? What about a, a hospital or a hospice? Undertakers? <laughs> we, 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 we're looking forward to a better place, aren't we? So, according to the, the view in, in many people's minds out there, is hell a place of comfort or of pain? Pain. Is it a place of luxury or torment? Torment. torment. So they say this is a place where pain and torment and is it singing or screaming? <laughs> it's screaming, isn't it? So now, now you must think for yourself now, so the new heaven and the new earth is going to have like this torture chamber. You know, friends, I don't have the time to go through all the questions with you tonight. There's many questions that I ask. And you'll see that, that this can't be. It can't be um, biblical. It can't be from God. This view that is being believed by many, many sincere people. Sincere people. Revelation 21 verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. So God is saying that the new heaven and the new earth is going to be no more sorrow, crying. So can hell fit into that picture? Do you understand? It's, it's, it's not possible. You can't reconcile it. It's not possible. There shall be no more what, friends? Pain. For the former things have passed away. 
So do you understand? God is saying that this is how it's going to be. And he's not just talking about a small little province. He's talking about the universe. So, Jesus is going to put an end to what Satan started. Amen? What do you say about that? In fact, he paid the price at the cross. Satan is on death row. He knows his time is short. That's why he's going around like a, a roaring lion. He's trying to destroy our lives at the moment, but he knows his time is short. I want you to study this picture. You must look at it slowly. Look at every face and every person. This is our planet today, friends. Can you see the deformity? Can you see the emaciation? Can you see the pain, the heartache? Do we want that part of our new world? We don't want that. Neither does God. Neither does God. God will do away with sin, suffering, pain, and hell forever. Would you want to torment your worst enemy for trillions of years? I believe that I believe that if we had to pass a judgment, <clears throat> let's say um, somebody who has done something very bad. Even if you are very, very angry and very, very upset, when that person's punishment starts and you see there's a, a suffering, there's something in our humanity that kicks in that says, no, that's enough now. You know what I'm saying? We say, no, that's enough. You get what I'm saying? Like, you, there's a very naughty boy in the neighborhood. And he throws a stone and it hits my little girl's head. And, you know, she's very hurt. And then we speak to his father and say, is this is the story I'm making up right now. And um, we say to his father, listen, this is what your son has done to our daughter. And we're upset, you know what I mean? Like, look what he's done. He says, okay. And he grabs his boy, and he ties him up in the garage. He rips off his back, like his shirt off his back, and he starts beating him with a fan belt. And he beats him, and he beats him. And you hear it like until 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. What are we going to do? We're going to get up and go, and say, no, this is enough. Now. I mean, he did bad. You know, that child's back is now finished. Can't even cry anymore. Do you understand? There's something in us that, that says, no, that's enough. So would you want to torment your worst enemy? Would you like to torment your worst enemy for trillions of years? We've got some sound effects coming through tonight. <laughs> That's a torment. Now, you know, friends, in the Christian world, there are more and more deep-thinking scholars that are rejecting the doctrine of an everlasting hell. More and more scholars are rejecting it. One of them is Dr. John Stott. Another one? back here. Sorry. Another one is Edward Fudge. He wrote this book, The Fire That Consumes. It exposes an unbiblical, as unbiblical the popular tradition which says God will keep the wicked alive forever in unending torment. So this um, evangelical Christian is rejecting the view of a hell that burns forever. The idea of an ever-burning hell for trillions of years 
is really a pagan doctrine and it's blasphemy to a God of love. This did not originate with the apostles, friends. It comes from med medieval mythology. That's where it comes from. And it infiltrated the church. And it's still there, sadly. So, tonight we have a few questions that we're going to ask. There's many Christians out there, deep-thinking Christians, that are asking these questions. They're asking questions about hell. When does hell occur? Is hell a hot spot burning in the center of the earth now? How long does hell last? How can a loving God destroy those he loves? You know, my children are naughty at times, and they need to be punished. But you know what? Sometimes you feel like you want to wring their neck, you know, like they're so naughty. Like <laughs> but when you see their little faces, and you realize they're sorry, you know, we have a prayer and a hug, and uh, we carry on. Other times, you know, there's a switch that it, it, it works from here to here. There's a switch that it actually opens here, you know. <laughs> Sometimes it's necessary to, to just, you know, touch a switch. But it's not, you know, a beating that, that um, goes on until 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Are we together? Mm. It's a smack and it's over. So God loves us. And do you think that's in harmony with God's character to, to want to punish people for eternity? These are questions that sincere Christians are asking. What about Satan? Does he have an end? Or is he going to be part of the new heaven and the new earth? Is he going to be there? What about sinners? What about sin? Is it going to be like this place where, where it's going to be kept alive? Hell is the final destruction of the wicked that purifies the earth at the end of time when they are totally consumed. That's what hell is. When God consumes sin, He consumes those who cling to sin. Now, if this is um, a hand grenade, you know the concept of a hand grenade. I've never thrown a hand grenade, but I know you've got to pull that pin and then you make sure that you... They don't throw it like this. Why? Because if it goes off, it will blow your head off. So they always throw it with a straight arm that it's maximum length away from your head. That's why they always throw a hand grenade like this. So sin is like a hand grenade where the pin has been pulled. What's going to happen if you hold on to it? You're gone. So what must you do? You must get rid of it. Get a distance between you and sin. So if you cling to sin, God is going to destroy sin. Are we together? And if you are clinging to sin, what's going to happen to you? You'll also be destroyed. Malachi 4 verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. Now I want to ask you something. Is that past tense? Present tense or future tense? Future. Can you see the day is what? Coming. It's future tense. This is very important. It's in the future. It's not present tense. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. Now, let's go back one. What is stubble? Stubble is, is, you know, like um, after you've, you've um, reaped a field. You know, you've got the wheat stubble. And when you burn it, does it burn easily or difficult? It's easy, isn't it? You like light it and it just burns. If it said that the wicked will be asbestos, asbestos doesn't burn. You know, it's like fireproof. But the Bible says they will be stubble and they will be burned what? shall burn them up. When you burn something up, is there anything left? No. Nothing. It's burnt up. Does the Bible say the wicked are in hell now? Malachi 4 verse 1. 
that will leave them neither root nor branch. So once again, it's future. A loving God doesn't bring the unsaved to a heaven where there is unselfish love because they are filled with selfish hate. Now what excludes us from heaven? It's our personal choice. It's not something that somebody will decide for you. It's a personal decision that each one has to make for themselves. Hell is not a hot spot in the center of the earth. It is the final destruction of the wicked at the end of time. 2 Peter 3 verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So if something is reserved, it's not happening yet. Are we together? So if you've got reserved seats, they are reserved for people to come and sit on them. Are we together? It's like we're reserving this. So, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So it's future. Are we together? It's reserved. Now we're going to look at the destruction of the wicked. The destruction of the wicked, number one. The wicked will be burned in the future. Do you agree? This is what the Bible is teaching. Malachi 4 verse 3. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be what? Ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. So, ash is proof of what? What has happened? There was a fire. So if you find ash, you will say, no, there was a fire here. Are we together? But is the fire still burning? No, because it's ash. The other day, my dad planted some potatoes. And uh, he cut them in quarters. Those ones that start making the little eyes on them. And then he went and he put some ash. That's uh, an old trick he learned many years ago when he farmed with potatoes. And he put some ash on that potato and he planted it. And there's beautiful potatoes growing now. So, the ash is cold, isn't it? He went there, there's no fire, the ash is cold, he just rolled the potatoes in there and planted them. So, ash is proof that the fire is finished. The wicked will be turned to ashes, not burned continually for millions and trillions of years. Do you want to say amen to that? Amen. That's good news. That's good news. Would God really enjoy all eternity with the redeemed if he was continually conscious of the screams of the wicked in hell? I want you to come on a little journey with me. Let's um, say we are in heaven. And we're going on, um, on a tour. And, and let's imagine an angel that is showing us the beauties of heaven. Can you imagine? It's beautiful. Taking us places, visiting other galaxies. And uh, the one day as we're traveling, um, the angel like moves us away. Like, let's go this way. No, but why can't we go this way? No, no, no. You can't go there. Why? No, no, no. That's where the wicked are being tortured. Can you hear those screams? Now this is now after like a million years in heaven. Are you still screaming? Now we know this is not possible, friends. You know, this is, but sadly many people believe that. I want to ask you a question. Does God know everything? Is God everywhere? Okay, so we call it omniscience. He knows everything. And omnipresence. So, if hell exists for eternity, will God be conscious of what's happening in hell? 
And because God is everywhere, will he, will hell be part of him? If you think about it, omniscience, omnipresence. So this becomes a big challenge now. If you start thinking, to say, is heaven going to be heaven for God? We might put in earplugs and say, we don't want to hear the screaming anymore. We've heard it enough now. But what about God? He's going to be always conscious of the torment in hell. Can you see that it can't work? Would God really enjoy all eternity with the redeemed if he was continually conscious of the screams of the wicked in hell? Can you see why people turn away from God? Can you see why they, they just walk away and say, no, there's no God because that can't be love. Because of hell, because of purgatory, because of all the stuff that's taught out there. Psalm 37 verse 20. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish. Into smoke they shall what? Vanish away. This is what the Bible teaches. The wicked shall perish. So number one, the wicked will be burned in the future. Number two, the wicked will be consumed, burned up and turned to ashes. What does the Bible mean when it uses the expression everlasting destruction or eternal fire? Now you find those words in the Bible. We've got to look at them. Hebrews 9 verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained what? Eternal redemption. Is Christ still on the cross? But it says eternal redemption. What is the meaning? The results of his redemption are eternal. Are we together? The results are eternal. That's why it's called eternal redemption. The results are eternal. One sacrifice of Christ on the cross provides eternal redemption. Hebrews 6 verse 2. Of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal redemption. Judgment. Now, is judgment going to continue forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No. Because there's a judgment and then there's eternal life. So we will experience eternal life after the judgment is complete. Amen? So the results of the judgment are eternal. So the judgment happens. It's called an eternal judgment because the results, you either forever saved or forever lost. Are we together? The results are eternal. The results of redemption and judgment will be everlasting. Jude 1 verse 7, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now you see friends, if you want to understand a difficult Bible verse, you have to compare with other scriptures. So, I've had the privilege of visiting a place which is believed to be the very spot where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be. In fact, we saw it on the slides tonight. It's called the Dead Sea. Did you know it's the only place on earth where there's no life? And what did Sodom and Gomorrah suffer? Eternal Fire. Are the fires still burning? So, if you make an example of something, it means that, you know, when you go into a shop, often they've got a little sample, you know, like you've got to taste it, then you know what the product's like. You know what I'm saying? It's like, or they put something on your car to, like a little sample, they shine. They don't shine your whole car, they just shine a little piece. They say, you see, this is what it can do. And that's a sample, and then you go and buy the tin, and you're often disappointed. You know? <laughs> so Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of 
eternal fire. Now, I want to um, ask, are there two brave people? I want a man and a woman, but you need to be brave. <clears throat> I don't want the faint-hearted here. <laughs> Tonight, I'm going to prove that um, hell still burns. <laughs> I've got some water from the Dead Sea, and I just want you to just put the tip of your finger, just to taste it. It's water. It's water from the sea. Who would like to taste? Two brave people? Okay. Dominique, come. You're brave. Okay. And anybody else? Okay. Basil, come. Okay. So, you need to um, face the audience. I want them to see you. And I want you to put your finger in there. Now we're going to see what, what hell is like. You see? Okay, taste it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is it burning? Yes, no, for sure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> now, friends, you can taste it on the way out. You can have a taste of the Dead Sea. It's ten times saltier than any ocean that we know. So, tonight you can say that <clears throat> hell is still burning. <laughs> what do you say, Dominique? It's still burning. <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah were set forth as examples of eternal fire. So, after the fire burnt up those two wicked cities, what was left? Nothing. In fact, there was no life that remained. Absolutely no life. There you've got a little picture of of uh, Lot's wife. Remember, she turned around and became a pillar of salt. Sodom and Gomorrah were burned with an eternal fire. So an eternal fire is not the one that eternally burns, but one that burns up that which it consumes so that it no longer exists. Are we together? So Sodom and Gomorrah don't exist anymore. They suffered the vengeance of what? Eternal Fire. Eternal fire, you can't put it out. It does its job and it's over. Second Peter 2.6 And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into, what friends? Ashes. Ashes. Condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Isn't this amazing? The, the verses are there. They're clear. We're just going to read them all together and you'll see what does eternal fire mean. They are an example. An eternal fire is one whose effects or results are eternal. Everlasting punishment is one punishment whose effects or results are everlasting. Now remember, it doesn't say there's everlasting punishing. It's everlasting punishment. So that punishment, the second death, friends, there's nothing after that. I'm sure there's some of us that can tell stories where something happened in your life and after that moment, there was no turning back. There was no way that it's like a flight that you missed. Are we together? You missed it. It's gone. So, it's very important that we look at the words. Everlasting punishment is not everlasting punishing. If we study the character of Jesus and you look how he treated people, he relieved suffering, didn't he? He relieved suffering. He, he tried to help people to make it easier. In fact, hell is called God's strange act in the Bible. And, and I can only imagine how hard it is for God to ultimately say, well, it has to end now. All of this is ending. We're starting a new life. And he puts an end to Satan, to sinners, to sin. It's all over. And the destruction of the wicked is a strange act for God. But he does it so that we can have life without sin. Amen? 
And those that are destroyed, it's because of their own choice. In 2007, we were in a car accident. My mom-in-law was very badly injured. And um, my father-in-law, sadly, he, he died after three hours. It was a very traumatic um, event in our lives. And in the Nero ICU in Bloemfontein, Vilna's mom, my mom-in-law was connected to uh, a lung machine and all sorts of other stuff to keep her alive. And there was another man that was also connected to the same type of machine. And you know, they put that, that pipe in that, you know, the, to help you breathe and the whole story. And I, I was going around praying for other people. You know, like I prayed for her and then I would go and pray for others as well. And I saw that this man had actually pulled his pipe out. And he was busy suffocating. So I went and called the nurse. I said, please come and help. And they put the pipe in again and he could breathe. So they, they actually tied his hands so that he couldn't do it again. Mm -hmm. So by rejecting God as the life giver, what are we doing? We're pulling that, the pipe out, isn't it? So ultimately, the second death is because of our choice of rejecting the giver of life. Does that make sense? We reject Him who is life. You can't live on your own. Even Satan doesn't have life in himself. Christ alone has life unborrowed. It's His own. Philippians 3 verse 18 and 19. They that are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction. The Greek word for destruction is one of the strongest words in the entire Bible. It means to be utterly consumed or totally destroyed. It means it comes to an end. This is a result of medieval mythology. You know the devil with a pitchfork? You see him in the comics? Now I want to ask you a question tonight. Who is in charge of hell? And you must think carefully. Who is in charge of hell? Because we've heard, you know, people are being taught out there that Satan is the one who roasts. You see, he's the one, you know, <laughs> he's the one that roasts the people, you know. <laughs> but who is hell prepared for? Satan and the angels. Are we together? So, so hell is prepared for Satan and the angels, so he can't be in charge of it. Are we together? If you catch a very bad criminal and you put him in prison, is he in charge of the prison? Or are there people there that make sure that that guy stays in the high security part of the prison until he... In America, there's places still where there's death row. You know, and you get executed. Alright? So, these are questions. We don't have the time to unpack it. But who is in charge of hell? It's not Satan. You see, God is the one who lets the fire come down from, from heaven at the end of the thousand years. There's no place now where it's cooking and Satan is there and he can go as he wants to and comes back as he wants to and then the, 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 the people that are lost, he comes and cooks them. <laughs> Isn't that what people are being taught? They are taught that. You know what? In the catechism of the Catholic Church, they've got pictures for the children to see how little children are being cooked there. And, and can you understand why they reject God? Can you understand why? Say, so, no, this can't be. God's plan has always included loving invitations to save people. Matthew 7 verse 13. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. So friends, according to the Bible, comparatively, 
There's going to be few that are saved and many that are lost. Do you agree? Narrow is the way to life. Broad is the way to destruction. So if we have to carry on with our, our questions, how many people are currently being tormented in hell? According to the Bible, there's none. Amen? No one. So in the future, there's a fire that will destroy the wicked forever. Here's the fate of the wicked. Romans 6.23, the wicked will die. Luke 13 verse 3, the wicked will perish. The wicked will be burned up according to Malachi 4 verse 1. The wicked will be utterly consumed, Psalm 37 verse 20. Now when you read those, those words, it sounds to me like there's going to be an end to the wicked. There's going to be an end to it. Utterly consumed. The wicked will be turned into ashes, Malachi 4 verse 3. The wicked will be as though they had not been. This is a powerful verse, Obadiah 16. It will be as if they had not been. Jesus paid the price for us. He died the second death. What is the second death ultimately, friends? It's an eternal separation from God, the giver of life. Remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So, hell in the future, the lake of fire, the fire comes from heaven. It destroys Satan, sinners, and sin forever. And that is the eternal separation from God. And that, I think, is going to be the worst moment when people realize that they could have been in the city. They could have been saved. They know that they rejected Jesus over and over and over again. And I'm so thankful that you are sitting here tonight because you want to know Jesus. You want to follow Him. You want to be ready for His coming. We don't want to be part of those that, that have this regret to say, if only, if only, if only. And then number seven, Satan will be totally destroyed. Isn't that good news? You know, there's been some very bad criminals um, on this planet. One of them, Ted Bundy. Anybody know the story of Ted Bundy? Okay, Ted Bundy, it's a bad story. I'm not going to go to the details. But uh, he, he um, was a serial killer. And he would um, follow women, single, mainly young girls that looked in a certain way, certain hair, and he would uh, club them to death. And then he would take their bodies. And he would... Um, possess them, own them. That's when they belong to him. And he did all sorts of terrible acts with those bodies. Terrible. Eventually, Ted Bundy was caught. And he was sentenced to death. And the night when Ted Bundy was executed, now, we're not sure of the number of people that he had killed, of young girls, we don't know. But the world rejoiced when Ted Bundy died. In fact, they, they, they had crackers going off when they realized that his life had ended. So if you think of Ted Bundy, And you compare what Satan has done over the millennia. I think all of us will be happy when Satan's no more. Amen? 
You don't want to have Ted Bundy living here in Westville. Do we agree? We don't want to know that he got out of the Westville prison. Are we together? You want to know that it's over, it's gone. It's finished. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Where some people say, no, the body is destroyed in hell but not the soul. But listen to this verse. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now in this context, soul means life. The life of the person. Your being. Destroyed. There's nothing left of you. It's over. Finished. What about the biblical expression, unquenchable fire? Mark 9, verse 43 and 44. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. Now this is a difficult verse. People say, Ooh, what is this all about? You know, this is clear up until now, but what is this all about? I want you to note that, <clears throat> first let me say this. There was a place um, close to Jerusalem called Gehenna. It was a place where, like a rubbish dump. And this fire was always being kindled, like our rubbish dumps as well. You know, you keep the rubbish dump, like burning the rubbish and so on. It was called Gehenna. And in, in the New Testament, Gehenna is translated as hell. So it was referring to a specific place where there were worms and the fire was kept alive. Now, friends, does the verse say that the people are kept alive or does it say that the worm and the fire are kept alive? Can you see that? So, the worm will exist while there's something to eat, isn't it? The fire will exist while there's something to burn. But when there's nothing more to eat, nothing more to burn, what will be left? Absolutely nothing. Alright, so you must be careful. When you see a verse like this, sit down and pray about it and ask the Lord to give you guidance. Isaiah 66 verse 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Once again, it does not say that the people are alive forever. It says that this fire is not quenched. What does that mean? It means that the fire you can't put out. It burns and burns and burns until it's done its work. An unquenchable fire is one that no human hand can put out. Are we together? Jeremiah 17, 27. Then I will kindle a fire in, the gates, in its gates and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it shall not be quenched. So yeah, we've got a beautiful example talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians and later by the Romans. And each time it was set alight. It says that that fire shall not be quenched. Is the fire still burning in Jerusalem? No. It burnt until it couldn't burn anymore. Here we have um, a picture of the destruction of Jerusalem. Was it on fire? Yes, it was on fire. Was it a, a severe fire? Definitely. In fact, there's some people b that believe, you know, Jesus said to the disciples, not one stone is going to be left upon another. You know the prophecy that Jesus told about the destruction of Jerusalem? Now they believe the fire was so hot it melted the gold. There was so much gold in the temple. And that gold went in between those rocks. So what did the people come and do afterwards? They turned those massive rocks over looking for what? For the gold. It was a very hot fire but it's not burning anymore. I can assure you I've been there. There's no fire burning there. So Jesus is giving us an invitation to eternal life. What is the opposite of eternal life? Eternal death. Okay? So if this is life, can there be life in this one? It can't be. Life ends. Are we together? Because what people believe out there is you either live forever in heaven or you live forever in hell. But that's not biblical. Because Jesus gives eternal life to the saved. He doesn't give eternal life to the lost. It's eternal death. 
Heaven is a beautiful place, friends, and we're going to put the past behind us. We're not going to be reminded that there's a torture chamber. That's where people are being hurt and pained and roasted for all eternity. That doesn't harmonize with God's character of love. Sin will be completely, totally destroyed. What do you say? That's good news. What about the biblical expression forever and ever? Now, this is a difficult one. So we're going to just look at this one. We, we're approaching the end of our seminar now. So we have to turn to the Bible to understand that expression. Revelation 14 verse 10. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night. Now people say, but what about that verse? How do we understand that verse? 19 verse 3. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. Now forever in the Bible can be translated until the end of the age. You've got to go to Webster's Dictionary. Look it up. What does forever mean? Until the end of the age. It sometimes refers to a limited time. So friends, the end of the age is when? It's when the holy city descends. That's the end. After that, eternity. Are we together? Because we've got the second coming of Christ, the thousand years, the new Jerusalem coming down. That's the end of the age. And then, eternity. Now, here's a few examples. We've got to turn to the Bible to understand the word forever. Exodus 21, verse 6. Then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And his master shall pierce his ear with an awl. And he shall serve him for how long? Forever. But what does that mean? As long as the servant is alive. Are we together? As long as his life shall last. Forever in the passage refers to a limited amount of time. The life of the slave. Jonah 2 verse 6, I went down to the moorings of the mountains, the earth with its bars closed behind me for how long? Forever. Forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. So how long was Jonah in the fish? Jonah was in the belly of the whale for ever or until the end of the age, until it was time for him to come out. The Bible says three days and three nights. But it talks about forever, until the end of the age. Are we together, friends? Now, this is a beautiful example. Our, um, our second daughter is named after this lady. What's her name? Hannah. And the mother of Samuel. Now, let's look at 1 Samuel 1.22. I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there for how long? Forever. Now, let's see what verse 28 says. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives he shall be lent to the Lord. Can you see the explanation in the same passage? Forever is as long as he lives. The wicked are in the flames until the end of the age, until they are totally consumed, until they are burned up, until they are no longer living. That's the meaning of forever. I want you to look at this picture. Can you see those two people there are ready to meet Christ? There's so many people, that man on his cell phone, his little boy wants time with him. People are addicted to drugs. People are chasing money. Jesus is inviting us tonight to make a decision. Because friends, it's either going to be eternal life or eternal death. And that death has no resurrection. That death has nothing after it. It's finished forever. So to recap, Satan and the resurrected wicked attack the city. Fire comes down from where? From heaven. So where does hellfire come from? It comes from heaven. It doesn't come from inside the earth. This is important. Now you're going to ask, but what about the rich man and Lazarus? 
Now, friends, I would like us to do a thorough study in a few weeks' time on this topic. It's a very important topic. But tonight, we're just going to touch on it briefly. It's in the sequence of five parables. What is a parable? It's a story with a lesson, isn't it? A parable is a story with a lesson. So it talks about the rich man and Lazarus. Now it's not Lazarus the brother of Mary and Martha. This is another Lazarus. Okay, so it is confusing, but this is not the same Lazarus. And it talks about Lazarus who was a poor man, and after his death he went to Abraham's bosom. And then the rich man, he went to the flames. All right? Now, <clears throat> if this is a literal story, we have some challenges. Abraham's bosom must be very large. <laughs> okay? People in heaven can see and have conversations with those in hell because in this parable, the, they're talking to each other. You see, and the, and the rich man says, I just need a little bit of water to little tip, you know, just touch my tongue to help me with this um, torment. Souls have fingers, eyes, and tongues. The meaning of this parable, friends, is that the choices in this life have eternal results. So, you can't afterwards change and say, well, you I'm here in in, in the fires of destruction, now I want to come out, I want to change my life. Are we together? It's because of the choices in this life that will lead to which destination you'll have. Either eternal life or a death with no resurrection, where it's over. And Jesus used a story that was known in that time to illustrate these truths. And I want to take my Bible tonight and I want to share something with you. It's from the book of Judges. And we're going to read from Judges chapter 9 from verse 8. Now listen to this carefully and you must tell me, is this literal or is this a parable? You must tell me. The trees once went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive trees said to them, Should I cease giving my oil with which they honor God and men and go to sway over the trees? Then the trees said to the fig tree, You come and reign over us. And then the fig tree makes excuses. Then the trees said to the vine, You come and reign over us. And then the trees said to the bramble, Is this literal or is it a parable? Why do you say that? Because we know that plants, the trees can't talk and make kings. So when you read the story of the rich man and Lazarus, it must be a parable because the dead know how much? Nothing. Nothing. Are we together? So we all know that trees can't talk and make kings. It's a parable. It's a story to teach a lesson. So this one, we can't say this is literal. It's a parable. So the true meaning of this parable, riches are not necessarily a sign of divine favor because he was the rich man and he was lost. The poor man was saved. There's no second chance after death. When you die, that's over. It's, you don't have a chance after that to make things right. Miracles are not a sign of divine favor. So, even Jesus said, even if somebody raises from the dead, if you've rejected Moses and the prophets and someone comes up from the dead, you won't believe them. And remember even of the resurrection of Lazarus from Bethany and the resurrection of Christ, on that Sunday morning, there were still those who rejected. Are we together? So friends, the truth about hell is found in the Scriptures. You must allow the Scriptures to interpret themselves. You and I have a choice. Tonight, we can say, Lord, I want to be part of the first resurrection. I want to be ready to meet you. I don't want to die the second death. That is eternal separation from God. 
Matthew 13, verse 50. And cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, friends, there will be pain in hellfire. I'm not saying tonight it's not going to be there. There will be torment. But it will end. Are we together? So it's not something that's going to go on. It's going to be a terrible experience, and then it's over. Matthew 22, verse 13. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is what happens when you are cut off from the God of life. There are multitudes today who are going to stand ashamed when Christ comes because you've rejected Him. And tonight I want to make an appeal. If you want to accept Jesus as your Savior, your King, your Lord, your friend forever, if you want to say, Jesus, you gave your all to me, I want to surrender my all to you. If you want to say, Lord, I know that you are a loving God. Ezekiel 18 verse 23. God says, do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? So, does Jesus have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? No. And not that he should turn from his way and live. So what is God's desire? Turn. Turn and live. So if you want to say tonight, Lord, I want to turn and live. Ezekiel 18.32 For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore turn and live. Tonight, that appeal is coming to us. I don't know what you're battling with in your life. There might be a secret sin. There might be unforgiveness in your heart. Someone that has hurt you. There might be a burden that you are carrying. And tonight you want to say, Lord, I want to surrender all. Maybe you've been misled, mistaught about the nature of God. And tonight you want to say, Lord, I can see that you are a loving God. And you want to surrender your life fully to Him. If that's your desire tonight, will you stand with me as we pray? Lord, tonight we've studied a, a difficult topic. It's a topic that has caused so much confusion in the Christian world. And sadly, your character of love has been misrepresented. Lord, thank you for the truth. Thank you that you have set us free tonight. Thank you that we can see that the new heavens and the new earth will truly be new that there will be no more sin and suffering and sorrow, only freedom and love and joy and peace. And Lord, tonight we are standing before you because we've chosen you as our Savior, as our Lord, as our King. And Lord, tonight I want to turn and live. We want to turn and live. We are turning our back on Satan, on sin, on everything that has caused a separation between us and you. Lord, please cleanse our thoughts, cleanse our hearts, cleanse our lives, and may we be there to say, this is our God. We have waited for him. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen.